So as he said, this is about functional programming in Scala. Um, this is going to be a pretty basic um, uh, talk. Um, so if you're familiar with Scala or familiar with functional programming, you may find it a little bit on the basic side. Um, but I'm going to try to gently introduce uh, Scala and then uh, get into a little bit of functional programming with the collections library, which is a pretty, I think, a pretty practical place to start looking at um, functional programming. Um, I uh, just, as a little background on myself, I'm a uh, consultant with Chariot Solutions. We're a small consulting firm outside of Philadelphia that um, does a lot of Java and more recently Scala work. Um, and uh, I've so I've been working with Scala for a couple of years at this point on some uh, mixed Java and Scala projects. Uh, and we also offer um, Scala training. Um, we deliver type safe training courses. Um, so with that background, I want to dive into um, a quick um, discussion of what functional programming is. Um, there's many aspects of functional pro whoops, I knew this was going to be a problem. Um, oh, that's what happened to that slide, okay. All right, so um, there's several aspects to functional programming, um, and there's a few that I'm going to concentrate on. So this is not an exhaustive list, but um, one of the main things is that functions are first class in a functional language. So um, like in object-oriented languages where we can pass around objects and do things with them, uh, in a functional language we can pass functions around. Um, functions are generally in a, in a functional programming style are free of side effects. They don't do, they don't change unexpected things, um, they don't perform I.O. in general, um, things like that that uh, change the state of the world. In the purest form, they would just take some input, do a computation, and return that value and not have changed anything at all. Um, and in general, data in functional programming is immutable. So we assign a value to a variable and uh, don't change that variable. Um, and that comes into play in the collections library in, in a big way. So. Let's look at the, I think that I, oh, okay. So um, we're going to talk about Scala. Scala is a JVM-based language that supports both the object-oriented and functional paradigms. So um, it's a hybrid language. It's, some languages are purely functional, some are purely object-oriented. Scala combines both of those styles. So. Um, it's a nice combination, a nice uh, pragmatic language, I think. It makes it very easy to, um, if you're coming at it from the background of being a Java developer, it makes it easier to get into the syntax because much of it looks a little bit, you know, it looks like what you would have done in Java in a lot of ways, like you use the dot operator a fair amount. Um, but then you get to start adopting the functional uh, style as well. So, Quick question. yeah. So I was, I was thinking about some conclusion. Yes. So that's again a JVM-based yes. functional programming. Yes. Yes. It is similar in many respects. As you said, it's a JVM-based language. Um, so both, of, both Scala and Clojure will interoperate with existing Java code. Um, the main difference between the two uh, is that Scala is a typed um, language, so things have definite concrete types assigned to them. Um, Clojure is an untyped language. So those are two main differences. Clojure is also much more of a functional, purely functional language than, than Scala is. So, very simple um, variable assignment in Scala. You just say val j equals 2, for example. Um, notice that we didn't provide any type for this 
uh, variable, right? Scala will infer that the type should be integer because um, we provided an integer on the right-hand side. Also, this, the fact that we said val here means that we're creating a variable that, that is immutable, so we won't be able to reassign to it. And actually, I should just go into the Scala REPL at this point. Um, one of the things that I really like about Scala uh, is the REPL. It's a really useful tool for being able to play around with Scala code. Um, because Scala interoperates with Java, it's also a really useful tool for playing around with Java code. Um, so I can go in here and um, type in what I just had on the slide. Whoops, I'm not in the REPL. All right, so now I'm in the REPL. I just type Scala, and uh, it says, welcome to Scala version 2.10. Now I type in what I had on the slide. Right, and the REPL shows that we defined a variable. It's of type n. Its value is 2. So there you see the type inference in action. Um, again, everything in Scala is typed, so um, there's always going to be something displayed there for a type. Um, you know, the same thing applies for a string. We can uh, assign a literal string value to a variable, and it will get um, type to string. Um, yes, it is, it is a lot like a constant, um, it can go out of scope, right, and then be, um, garbage collected, um, um, it, it is a little bit different if it's, if it's an object, um, an immutable object potentially could be the internals of it could be um, mutated, although, again, we try to make our objects immutable. Um, you you could you could assign if if you had an object, say a Java object, for example, that where the internal state is mutable by default, uh, you could assign it to a val, and you could you couldn't reassign to that. Uh, val anymore, that variable, but you could mutate the state of the object. Right, so, the, so, so the reference would be immutable. Right, the reference would be immutable, right. So it's like Java final, not C constant. It's, it's like Java final, yeah, exactly. Um, I, when, when we're talking about variables, it's like a Java final. Um, but the general principle of immutability right, is that we wouldn't even be able to mutate the contents of the object. And, and in general, in Scala, we'll program objects so that they're not, so you can't mutate the internal state of them. So, uh, right. So, um, so that's the simple variable assignment. So now I want to talk about defining functions in Scala. Um, the simplest function that I can think of is to have a function that takes no arguments and returns a constant value. It's not a terribly useful function, but, um, but that's the simplest function. And illustrates a little bit of the syntax of, um, of uh, Scala functions. So here I'm assigning to a variable called simplest. And what I have on the right-hand side is a argument list that has nothing in it. This rocket operator, um, which indicates that it, this is going to be a function, and my return value, which is the constant string, right? So um, that results in, again, uh, 
I didn't define what the type of simplest is, but Scala did type inference on it and said, ah, this is a function. So this is going to be a function from no arguments to string, and the type of it is function zero. Um, so you'll, you'll see as we go through this I, um, that Scala defines a object or a class that represents functions that take various um, numbers of arguments. So this takes no arguments, so it's a function zero. When it takes one argument, it's going to be a function one. Um, when it takes two arguments, it's going to be a function two. So because this is running on the JVM, right, the JVM doesn't natively support functions as first class citizens. So we have to model this as, as an object, which is what Scala is doing. And so if we went into the REPL and executed simplest, it would return a value of hello world. Um, whenever you do something in the REPL, in the Scala REPL, if you don't give it a, a name, here I've given the variables names. So it uses that value, right? But if I just like make a constant value, it's going to get assigned to a made up variable name, res zero, which I can then use later on. So here I called length and it assigned that to a different um, variable. So whenever you see this res zero, res one, whatever, that's the result of doing something in the REPL. Uh, yeah. So if you, if you were to add this stuff to like a, like a sort of code rather than doing it in the interpreter, will it automatically create those essentially as variables? Or would you execute those? So if you, do it, if you do it in source code, you can't do exactly what I was doing there. That's something that's just uh, a REPL thing. Yeah. Um, in source code, I would have to. Uh, explicitly assign it to some variable if I want to keep the value. Does, does Scala have anonymous functions? Does it? I'm sorry? Does Scala have anonymous functions? Yes. Um, if I didn't assign the... Well, well, we'll see it when we get into the collections, okay. Um, the next uh, more uh, complicated function I think is the identity function where we would take one argument of type any. So now I'm explicitly saying what the input parameter is going to be and then returning a value. Again, this is going to be a function that's assigned to the, to the name identity. So um, any in Scala is like um, basically like object in Java. It's the kind of catch-all. Um, uh, type. Um, so, right, so I created this um, function. Now, if I, I, I can use that function, I, I guess I'm not sure if I showed this very well on the previous one. Um, I can use that function by calling it and passing a value in parentheses. And in this case, it just returns the value that I passed in, right? Um, because I use the type of any, this could also be a string instead of a number, and it'll return that value. Yeah. Is there any way to, to get that type into follow through? See how one and hello are both any instead of instant string? Um, 
So I'm not. Ex I'm, um, could you, I mean, is there a way to cast? cast you could. You can cast it. Yes. Um, I don't think there's. I don't think there's a way without talking about um, without talking about uh, type type parameters. You know, I think if we put in a type parameter, we would achieve the same effect, but it would uh, retain the type of the argument that was passed in. Okay. Well, if, you, if, if you've got casting and you've got, do you, do you have RTTI at all? Can you, can you determine the type of, of, of a variable? Yeah, you can certainly determine the type of a variable, yeah. Well, well, then you could, just, you could just cast the return back to the type of the, the, the input, right? You could, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, at runtime, you could you could certainly do that. Oh man. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Um, now, getting to a function that does a little bit more work, um, we could define an add one function that takes in a value again, one parameter returns that value plus one, and then we would use it like this call the add one function, pass in a value, and we get back an integer. Okay, so I want to move on to the collections library at this point and start making use of these functions that we defined over here. So Scala has a um, rich collections library, and this is another one of what I think is the cool features of Scala. Um, it basically breaks down into three categories. The seeks, which um, the primary seeks are list and vector. Um, these are things that where it basically retains the order that you put the elements into the collection. Um, a set, which is uh, you know an un unordered collection of uh, objects without any duplicates. And then a map, which um, is a mapping of key value pairs. So it's pretty easy to, compared to, especially compared to Java, it's very easy to make a collection in Scala. Um, if I want to make a, a vector of uh, numbers, I use a syntax, use this syntax. Just say vector, the name of the collection that I want, and then in parentheses, pass a set of values that I want in that collection. And I'll get a vector that contains those numbers. Is the exception to all be the same type? No. They could be different types. Um, what's going to happen if they're different types is that you're going to get a different, the type of the vector is going to be different. Um, but it, the, the, so let me just um, illustrate this in the REPL. So, if I create a vector of integers, then what I get back is a collection, a vector uh, that's type two int. If I um, then add a string in there, I can create that. Um, Let's get that on the screen. Okay. Okay, so I can create that vector that has a string in it as well as numbers, and that's fine what I get as a result is a vector that's typed to any because that's the only type that can um, represent both a number and a string. Um, making a set is similar. Um, you can make a set and it can contain uh, whatever values you want. So that's, that's a nice sort of constructor syntax. Um, for a map, a map is a collection of key and value pairs. So um, the syntax that we usually use in maps is like this. You have a key and then this uh, dash greater than sign and value. Um, 
and the syntax for creating a map then is map and in parentheses you um, put a key value, the arrow and uh, a value. And I'm missing a, should have a close paren on the end there. So collections by default in Scala are immutable. When we've been creating these um, types, uh, like here I type, I said I want a vector that contains one, two, three, four. I got a scala.collection.immutable vector. Um, there is a separate package in the collections library. This is the immutable uh, package. There's a mutable package as well. So if I want to have a mutable collection, I can get it. Um, but by default, the, you know, the easiest way to type it is to get an immutable collection. Can you make an uh, infinite collection that's lately evaluated, like something like the Fibonacci sequence with all the numbers for instance? Um, you could, yeah. So, yeah, so collections are immutable by default. Um, when you change the collection, you're actually returning a new collection. Um, and the original collection is going to be unmodified. Um, so once we get into looking at uh, some of the methods that could modify the collection, we'll see um, how that works. Actually, I could probably see if I can illustrate that with... Um, Right, it doesn't like that. Right, I'm, uh, that's what I get for trying to go off the script. Um, okay, so, now that we know how to um, um, something has gone wrong with my presentation here. It's missing. Um, Oh, no, it, it's not missing it. Sorry, I got confused. Um, so I want to talk about higher order functions in the context of the Scala collections library. Um, in general, higher order functions take a function as an argument, and they can return a function result. This comes into play a lot in the collections library. Uh, most of the collections have higher order functions like filter, exist, find, group, and map. Um, so let's take a look at some of these. So the filter takes a predicate function that has a signature like this. Um, takes some input value. This is a type parameter here. This t A just represents any type. Um, and returns a Boolean value, true or false. So We'll take some value and we'll evaluate whether um, that value is true or false. When you use the filter function on a collection, it applies it to all the elements of that collection. And then it produces a collection that contains the elements from the original collection where the predicate returned true. So how's this work? So if we create a um, vector of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, um, we can call the filter function and def pass in a function. Here we're defining a function that takes a int parameter. Uh, this is a, you know, a vector event, so it makes sense for this input parameter to be a type int. Um, and then we're saying return true if x is greater than 3. So 
we're taking in a, a single parameter, returning a Boolean value. It's going to go and apply that to all the elements of the collection. Obviously, 1, 2, and 3 are not greater than 3, so they get removed from the collection. They get removed from the uh, resulting collection, and we just have 4 and 5 remaining in the resulting collection. So this is where we can look at the immutability of collections. So um, so if I take my um, existing um, collection of numbers and apply that function that I had, since this collection only had 1, 2, 3, and 4 in it, I'm left with a collection that has only four in it. But if I go back and um, ask to see um, res4 again, it still contains the four values. It still contains one, two, three, and four, right? So the result of the filter collection was a new collection that only contained one value. The original collection is still there. It's, it was not mutated. Um, we could do a similar thing to um, to a list of fruits. Um, we could filter it to the ones where the first letter in the fruit is a P. So you can do it to you know any type of, ver uh, of um, parameter, int, string, object, whatever. Um, so, does the filter function make sense? The, uh, so, I'm going to move on to the map function. The map function takes a function that has this signature, some element of type A, and it returns a value of type B. So, it can transform a collection from one type to another type. Um, the collection will end up having the same number of elements as the original collection, unlike in the filter where you could reduce the number of um, elements in the collection. So again, it applies it to all the elements of the collection, produces a new collection that contains those results. Um, so to apply this, we would take uh, again, a vector of numbers. We could define a function that adds one to the um, input value, and we get back a, another vector of ints which contains the same number of values just with one added to each element. Okay, so um, I want to talk about why, why we should do it this way, um, as opposed to the way that we've done it in the past, like in Java. Um, it's a question that sort of came up in one of the training courses that I was doing. It kind of was the, what led to this presentation. Um, if you think about the code that we would have used in Java to um, implement the kind of thing that I just showed, right? We would have maybe an add one function. It would take in a list of integers. It would loop through that list of integers and um, return a new collection that it had built up that contains those um, values. So. What's the difference between those besides the number of lines of code, right? There's a lot fewer lines of code in the Scala version versus the Java version. Um, the big, one of the big differences is internal versus external iteration. In Java, we're doing an external iteration where 
we're telling the computer how to iterate over that collection. We're explicitly writing a for loop that says, you know, how to iterate through it. Start at the first one, go to the last one. Um, in Scala, we don't, we're, we're not doing that. We're doing an internal iteration where we're telling the computer how, we're not telling the computer how to iterate the collection. We're just saying, okay, take this collection and transform it by applying this function to it. You, it's up to you to figure out how to um, go and visit each element in the collection and make it, um, you know, have this function applied to it. Um, if you want to read more about that, this uh, state of the lambda um, or state of the collections article is pretty good. So what, what benefits does that get? Well, I think it improves testability compared to the Java code. Um, if what we're trying to implement is a function that will, you know, in this case we're doing add one, that's a pretty simple function, right? But if it's a more complex function, uh, it's easier to test that function in isolation without having to deal with the for loop part of it. Um, we can obviously reuse that without having a for loop around it. And then another big reason is it's easy to change the iteration approach. With the, other, with the Java code, we're locked into that for loop iteration over the collection. With the um, Scala approach, the functional approach, we have much more flexibility to change what that collection is and still apply the same um, uh, logic to it to transform the collection. So that the so what I want to try to do is to look at using parallel collections to um, operate on a uh, operate on a um, set of data. Um, in Scala, we can get a parallel implementation of a collection by calling this par function. Um, so for example, if we've already defined this collection nums, we can call the par function and get this parallel dot immutable dot par vector instead of the, the vector that we started out with. Um, so what do we have now? We have a collection that whenever you operate on it with a higher order function, it's going to do that through a process of um, using multiple threads to do it. It's going to use this, the fork join framework to spin up as many threads as it can to um, do the processing. So we're splitting the work across multiple threads. Uh, ultimately, that may reduce the overall amount of time it takes to complete whatever operation we need to do, right? So imagine we have a queue of work to do. Uh, the work is computationally intense in some way. Um, so it's something that's more CPU bound than IO bound. Um, I'm going to use a naive Fibonacci algorithm just as an example of something that takes some time. I would imagine that's not what your real work is going to be. Um, and try to find the Fibonacci number for a vector of input numbers. So I'm going to, this is my naive um, Fibonacci implementation. Um, still doesn't fit on the screen. Um, here I'm using I, I'm using the method definition syntax instead of the the literal function syntax. Um, but what this is saying is um, we're going to define a method called fib. It takes in a integer value, returns an integer value, and then it uses recursive um, the standard recursive Fibonacci um, algorithm. And then if I try it out, I call fib of 20, I get back the value 6,765, 6, which agrees with Wikipedia, so it must be right, right? Um, 
So how long does it take? Well, now we can uh, get into another aspect of functional programming that I mentioned earlier, which is passing functions as first class objects, right? So um, this method called profile is a method that will take a function as its first argument. So the first argument is named code, and it's typed as taking as being a uh, function um, that returns some value r. And then this function has a second parameter, um, t, which is a long value. And we're going to default that to system.currentTime millis. Um, so this is another feature of Scala, which is that you can provide default values for your arguments, which is pretty nice. And then what this function is going to do is um, return the result of executing the function code, and it's going to return the value of system.currentTimeMillies minus the value that we started with, the, the start time. So what we've just defined there is a tuple, which is a container for an arbitrary number of items. Kind of sounds like a collection. Items can be of different types. Um, What's different about this is that um, right, the items can be of different types. So we're not going to try to um, try to type the overall collection to a single type, right? We're, we're just going to say, here's a bu one bucket, here's another bucket, here's a third bucket. They can be of whatever types you want them to be. Um, And so defining a tuple is done by uh, putting parentheses around two or more values. So here I define a tuple that contains two things that are of type int. Here I define a tuple that contains three things of int, string, and double. Okay. Um, so if you look back at the code that it was defined here, what this is ultimately returning, this is inside of parentheses, so it's a tuple that contains the result of executing this function and a uh, long value. Uh, tuple values can be extracted by providing um, arguments inside of a sort of a tuple syntax. Okay, so um, what I'm going to what I can do now that I have this profile function defined is call profile, pass it a function which is defined as um, my fib function with the value 30 passed to it. And the result of that is going to be the result, the Fibonacci number, and the number of milliseconds that it took to execute that code. Uh, here we're extracting the two elements of the tuple into variables so that we can see the see those individual pieces. And then I can, you know, try it for the fib value of 40. It takes 622 milliseconds. The fib value of 45, it now is taking 6.2 seconds. So that's taking some noticeable amount of time. Uh, now, I could create a vector of numbers. In this case, I've made them all 43. Um, just for, just so that they're all the same. They're all going to take the same amount of time. And take that vector and map it by um, executing the fib function for whatever the value is in that position in the collection. So I'm going to get back a vector that contains the results, the Fibonacci numbers for 43. And the total amount of time that took. In this case, it took nine and a half seconds to execute that. That was done with a standard vector, right? So that's a standard sequential um, processing of the collection. If I take that and 
make it a parallel collection instead. I take vector 43, call par on it, and then call map on it. I get a parallel implementation instead, and that ends up taking four point, about 4.9 seconds, almost five seconds to do that. So it took, you know, about half the time, maybe a little more than half the time that the sequential operation did. And if you watch your um, CPU while this is executing, it's going to, the previous version would use one core for nine seconds. This version uses all your cores for four and a half seconds. So you can see that it's, it's doing some work. So, so the main message here is not so much about, um, you know, whether this particular parallel implementation is good for what you're doing. Um, it may or may not be. Uh, you may be better served by other implementations. But the main point is we didn't substantially change the code here, right? We're using the same function that contains the logic that we want to apply. We're, you know, with the exception of putting in this par here, it's basically the same code that we wrote before, right? So we have, a, I think, a lot better flexibility, a lot nicer flexibility in Scala for um, uh, working with our collections. So a couple of resources I would recommend if you want to pursue um, Scala and functional programming uh, more is uh, this book called Functional Programming in Scala. Um, this is, this is going to get into, you know, I've been talking about what I think is kind of the first level of functional programming, which is using um, the higher order functions in the collections library. This is going to start going into the next level of um, being more generic about uh, extracting common bits of functionality into functions and um, composing functions together. Uh, if you want a treatment that's more um, oriented towards somebody coming from a Java or other object-oriented background, this Functional Programming Patterns in Scala and Closure is a good book. Um, it examines, he, he, basically each chapter is an example of something that we would have done in the object-oriented Java world. Um, and then he goes, okay, here's how we would implement that in, in Scala, and here's how we would implement that in Closure. So it's a great way, first of all, to get a general, you know, kind of a general introduction also to compare the two languages, Scala and Clojure, because you get um, a solution in both. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Um, so the collection you said it was a library, it's not built in? It, it's a, it's a, they call it the collections library, but it's, oh. it's part of the standard Scala um, library. Um, I, I can't. I, I'm sorry. I don't have a good recommendation for that. Um, my background is not in functional programming, so um, uh, I, does does it look very similar to what you, in some respects, what you did? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, usually, uh, you'll have some, you know, usually in the projects that I've worked on, there's been some portion of the project that is written in Scala and some portion of it that's written in Java. And then, you know, they'll be packaged together into, um, uh, 
Well, they'll be packaged together, like you might have a jar file that contains Scala code and a jar file that contains Java code, and they're loaded up into the same uh, Java process, right? And then um, they can just communicate with each other as if they were, it was Java code. Well, they so, can share well, they can share objects, objects right? Yeah. Um, you there are there are some conversion utilities in the Scala libraries that would that help you get from Java collections to Scala collections and back the other way. Um, and those you know those work pretty well when you need to um, interact with the Java code. A, a common place a, a common thing that I. Uh, think happens is that people bring in Scala and start writing some of their tests in Scala, some of their test code. So they've got Java code, they start writing test code in Scala, um, and then they start moving the Scala code into, you know, actually writing the production code in Scala. So that's another common pattern for mixing the two together. No, um, it's Scala is not a you know it's a hybrid language, so um, it's going to uh, use the basically the same facilities that Java does for doing I/O. It, yeah, Scala doesn't really define new I/O um, primitives. So if I was going to write to a file, I would still use the file object, you know, or the in I.O. or you know something like that from Java to um, do that. Um, you know, in this example that I was showing, um, back here, right, we're calling, this is the Java system dot current time millis that we're calling right here. So, um, this is, uh, you know, an example right here of Java and Scala interoperability. Well, this is a this is a default value here. Um, right. If something hasn't been provided for this second argument, um, it's going to use this value. It's going to use the result of calling system dot current time millis. I think that the map is the, map. Okay. the equivalent of a hash, as far as I'm aware. So one of you know one of the things that I was um, Um, in the Scala REPL, you can play around with, uh, you know, whatever code is loaded up on the um, class path, you can play around with it. Uh, it's pretty easy to, since you're running it in Java, it's pretty easy to play around with some code that's in the standard library for Java. So, like Java X.crypto is um, um, some standard, uh, you know, part of the standard library, right? So, we could import some classes from standard Java and uh, start playing around with them. Um, Sorry? Uh, I've never used that from, from Scala code. Yeah, I've never used that. All right, thanks.